Hello, and I'm absolutely thrilled uh, to have a very special guest, John Suchet. Yes, John Suchet, um, wonderful, wonderful Beethoven specialist, um, presenter at Classic FM Radio. Also, John has published really seven books about Beethoven. Seven, seven books. So, <laughs> John, is del I'm, I'm just delighted to have you here. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank yeah. you. Nice As I mentioned, it's absolutely terrifying. So, so, <laughs> um, so um, I would like to start by asking you a couple of just really quick questions, really a blitz on Beethoven, if that's possible. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, what is your best loved fact about Beethoven? My best loved fact. Simply the greatest composer who ever lived. Okay, okay, that. fantastic. Um, I know that's not easy, but what are your favorite pieces? I know it can't be one, so let's do pieces. Yes, yes, very good question. Anyone who says the favorite piece, singular, silly really, because <laughs> there's so much there. Um, in the orchestral works, it has to be the symphony number no. three, the Eroica which to me is like a novel. It's like reading a novel. You never quite know what's going to happen next. Even when you know what's going to happen next, it still takes you by surprise from the beginning right through to the end. I could keep talking for the next, for the next half an hour just about the Eroica, but I won't. So the big orchestral piece is the Eroica. But for me, Beethoven's piano sonatas are his supreme achievement. To me, the sonatas, the piano sonatas, which are the only form he wrote in consistently throughout his life without a serious break between them, to me, they are his autobiography. Mm. He was no good with words. He said, I'd rather write a thousand notes than a single word. And when he wants to tell us about his life, he goes to the piano. And for me, of all the 35, not 32, 35, the one that tells us most about Beethoven and the one affliction that he bore throughout his adult life, his deafness, is Opus 110. Mm. So the middle of the final set of three piano sonatas. He, he, he sounds uh, a melody in it and he writes on the manuscript page, Klagender Gesang, mm. dolful, doleful song. Mm. And when it comes to the repeat, he cuts it off and he sounds a chord and he repeats it no fewer than nine times before going into this huge inverted double fugue. To me, that is Beethoven telling us about his deafness, how he had to struggle with the one affliction that should, the one um, uh, sense that in him should be more acute than in any other type of person, namely a musician, mm -hmm. but he overcame it. And I think that is his message to us. If I can overcome the worst affliction that can befall a, a, a musician, you can overcome yours. So in, in my, my all time favorite Beethoven piece is the Piano Sonata Opus 110. The orchestral piece is the uh, Eroica Symphony, Symphony Number no. 3. And there's got to be a string quartet in mm -hmm. there. And for sheer joy, I would go for one of the Razumovskis from the middle uh, the middle period, but I think for intensity, it has to be Opus 130. The, the, I think that was the one to third of the five late quartets. And it has in it this movement, which he rather misleadingly calls cavatina, which is a kind of dance. But in it, the violin weeps. And a friend of his said, I saw him weeping as he composed it. He said, nothing caused me greater pain. And of course, it comes at the time of his struggle with his nephew. He's been through a five-year court case with his sister-in-law. Finally, he's a single parent and learns what that's like. Then his nephew is heading towards a suicide attempt. His life, Beethoven's life, is in turmoil. His deafness is... Uh, complete, um, uh, absolute, and his health is in terminal decline. Listen to that violin, uh, sorry, that string quartet, not knowing any of that. Yeah. And it's an incredible piece of music. Once you know that all that's happening in his life, you just sit there going, oh my God. Beethoven's music, I think for Beethoven, more than any other composer that I can think of, 
his music is remarkable, but if you know what's going on in his life at the time, you listen to it with different ears. Sure. So my long-winded answer, Julia, the Eroica Symphony, Opus 110, <laughs> and Opus 130, Late String Quartet. I, I love the answer. It doesn't mean you went over time. We can allow that. You know, there are no rules here. Okay. But uh, fantastic. Fantastic. But let's continue. And uh, what would be the question you'd ask Beethoven if you met him? Who was she, Ludwig? Who was she? <laughs> We'll come back to that. We'll I, know, back. I, know, I know the musicologists would have all kinds of questions. Why is the Eroica in E flat Ludwig? No, 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 no. Who was she? Tell us once and for all the identity of your immortal beloved. That's my question. And we are coming back to that topic because okay. there's no way I can miss that in, in, in a conversation about Beethoven. But then... Let's let's you know let's take that as as the mystery you know the kind of in the personal life. Yeah. What would you really like to let's say know about Beethoven about maybe his life or his style that you can't find in the books? I mean, they're they're bound to be something when we were researching, and you said, well, I I'd wish I'd known this. Yeah, I mean, I've read just about everything that, that's been written about Beethoven. I mean, so many hundreds and hundreds of books about his compositions. Um, I remember being daunted when I discovered a 250-page book about a single composition, the Diabelli Variations. Now, put the music to one side. What fascinates me about him is his life. I have here in, in, in my flat in London, um, a life mask of Beethoven in solid bronze, uh, taken from the life mask. Um, they ran off hundreds of copies in the 19th century, and it's got laurel leaves around here. Yes. Look at any statue of Beethoven, and he's standing there like some god. Look at the statue in, in the Münsterplatz in Bonn, mm -hmm. striding away. But he wasn't like that at all. He was about five foot, I don't know, five or six, stocky, Leonine features, mm -hmm. dusky skin, probably had some black blood in him too from the Spanish Moors who mm -hmm. occupied the Netherlands where his family came from. And I remember there's a lovely quotation. He, he, um, he proposed marriage to a young soprano in the choir in Bonn. Uh, so he was only about 18 or 19 at the time. Her name was Magdalena Villman. Um, and she turned him down. But a Beethoven researcher, I think it was Thayer, um, when Thayer went to Germany, he interviewed people who had, who had known Beethoven or known of Beethoven. And one of the people he interviewed was Magdalena's gr either granddaughter or great-granddaughter. And he, uh, he was interviewing her about her grandmother or great-grandmother's connection with Beethoven. And the woman said, of course, as you know, Beethoven proposed to my grandmother, my great-grandmother, um, and Thayer said, why did she turn him down? And her answer was, oh, obviously, because he was ugly and half crazy. <laughs> now, those words had come down in the family through the generations. Now, they may have been embellished, but there's a grain of truth there. That is not Beethoven the God, it is Beethoven the man who has to eat and drink, clothe himself, pay his rent, and that's the man that fascinates me. And um, when I, I've been to Bonn many times and, 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 and to the Beethoven birth house there, and, and rather than these huge musicological analyses of his works, I've been fascinated by little booklets that I've picked up there, one of which was Beethoven's favorite food. And did you know he loved to cook? And he used to invite his friends round to dinner with him cooking, and they dreaded it. And one of them has left a wonderful eyewitness account of how three or four of them finally plucked up the courage to accept the invitation. They arrived at Beethoven's apartment in the Milka Bastai, climbed all those stairs. He opened the door. He had on a chef's hat and an apron, and he dished up chicken stew. And as one of them, I think it was Ignaz Seyfried, who was the uh, concert master of the, of the orchestra at the Theater and der Wien, said the problem was you had to separate the oil off the top to get to the chicken. He said it was almost inedible, but Beethoven was so proud, we had to compliment him. Only the juice of the grape made the evening worthwhile. 
Now that to me tells me more about Beethoven. So I would love to know more about how he lived, his life. We know the restaurants he used to go to. We know the food he would tend to order. We know how he used to entertain himself. So I want to know more about Beethoven, the man. We must not always have him on this pedestal as some kind of God. He was a man. Well, um, it's, it's really remarkable, I must say. Uh, I, <laughs> I, I, I would die to, to, to be able to kind of see his dinner and maybe yeah. I'd die after the dinner, but <laughs> yeah. who cares? <laughs> who cares? Um, really interesting. And um, of course, this, this is also, uh, let's go back to sort of his childhood. And there was this very problematic relationship with his father, right? Yeah. I mean, who was an alcoholic. I mean, dare I say abuser? I mean, maybe that's kind of the right word or the wrong word, but certainly it's not a healthy relationship between the father and the son. That's true. And I, I think it's been exaggerated, to be honest with you. Yes, the father was not very kind to him. And the first teacher that he hired, um, I think the chap's name was Pfeiffer, something like that. And they used to go out drinking together and they would come back in the middle of the night and Beethoven's father would drag him to the piano and beat his fingers if he didn't play it. Well, that's in a childhood. That they were living at the time in, in a large house occupying the first floor apartment. The family that owned the house were the Fisher family and Gottfried Fisher, it was the, he was the local baker. Gottfried was the son who was actually younger than Beethoven um, and observed all this kind of thing and wrote up his account of Beethoven's childhood 60 years later. Now, it's certainly true the father did turn to drink. And by the way, do you know almost certainly why he became an alcoholic? Because his father, who was Beethoven's grandfather, who was Kapellmeister, brilliant musician, top job at court. He was actually a singer, not an instrumentalist or a composer, but he had come from Mechelen in the Netherlands, moved to Bonn to take up this position. And there was quite a little um, colony of Dutch exiles in Bonn. And Beethoven Senior, whose name was also Ludwig, used to import wine and sell it to them. Mm. So there were boxes of wine around the house the whole time. And his wife, our Beethoven's grandmother became an alcoholic yes. and had to go into a home where she died. Their son, Johann, our Beethoven's father, became an alcoholic. And certainly he misbehaved. Beethoven had to go and rescue him from a, a police prison for being drunk and disorderly. And then he had to petition the elector, the prince elector, to pay his, sal his father's salary to him and so on and so forth. But I think cases of violence have been greatly exaggerated. He may not have been a very pleasant man. His wife, Beethoven's mother said, what is marriage but a chain of sorrows? So he wasn't a good husband or father, but I wouldn't like to go too far down the, the abusing line. I, I don't think he was that bad. He was just a drunk. Yeah, 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 yeah. But still not, not an easy start and you no. know, Beethoven had to really look after his family. And uh, so my question is, do you think that, you know, his sort of authoritative uh, relationship later with his brother's um, wife came from the ritual, the feeling that he's the head of the family, and then he can sort of step in into these relationships? Very much so. Um, it was, I mean, in Germany and Austria at the time, the eldest son assumed the role of father once the father was no longer there. And, excuse me, Beethoven moved to, uh, from Bonn to Vienna one month short of his 22nd birthday. Within a year, his father back in Bonn died. So Beethoven was in effect head of the family, but he was in Vienna and the family was in Bonn. But then his two younger brothers, the only two that survived into adulthood, moved to Vienna to be with him which frankly was the last thing he wanted because he had to assume some kind of responsibility for them, even though they were adults and his relationships with them were not good uh, right through their lives. I mean, Carl, the, the, his, uh, the eldest of the two younger brothers, he had an appalling relationship with. Johann at least didn't try music. He became a pharmacist and moved to Linz. But Carl was, a, I mean, 
how cruel he was a musician, but a mediocre one. And his brother was Ludwig van Beethoven. So, you know, he stood no chance. But yes, Beethoven always felt a responsibility towards his brothers as head of the family. Then Johanna comes along, who Karl marries. Now, she was, it has to be said, a young lady with a certain reputation in Vienna. She was already pregnant with their child before they married. Um, and soon after they, uh, Beethoven tried everything to stop him marrying her, but he married her. Soon after they married, she made a catastrophic mistake. A friend, a female friend, gave her a string of pearls to look after, and she claimed the, pole, the, the pearls had been stolen. Uh, the police turned up at, at their house, and very quickly, it, it, it's actually rumored she was wearing them when the police turned up at the house. Anyway, they were quickly found to be in her possession. As a result of which, she was charged with theft and convicted. She was sentenced to something like a year and a half in prison. It was commuted right down to six months house arrest. So she never served a jail sentence, but it gave her a criminal record. So when Beethoven took her to court many years later for custody of their son, she had a criminal record, which, of course, initially won that court case. He had a very, very fraught relationship with her. It needs a psychiatrist to sort it out. It needs him on a psychiatrist couch for many hours of psych Freudian psychoanalysis. Was he actually in love with her? Therefore, he despised her because he knew he couldn't have her? Or did he genuinely hate her? I don't know. I don't know the answer to any of these because I'm not a psychoanalyst and we can't speak directly to them. But he did behave, in my view, appallingly towards her. After Carl died, he took her to court for a court case that lasted for nearly five years to exclude her from the upbringing of her son. And ultimately, he won. And boy, did it cost him dear in terms of health and tension and nerves and all that. But you know, an extraordinary thing, Julia, Johanna outlived Beethoven by something like 40 or more years. And as far as I know, despite the way he treated her, I've not discovered her having uttered or written a single word against him. Quite extraordinary. If it had been today, the tabloid newspapers would have beaten the path to her doorstep. Kiss and tell. Here's loads of money. Tell us about this man. But no, it never happened. And she died actually in poverty. Um, uh, and, and, but as I say, I, I can't find any trace of her attacking her famous brother-in-law. And I do think he, he treated her pretty disgracefully. Oh, such a story. I mean, but the, just the, the, his life is a, such a roller coaster, you know, it's one yeah. thing after another. And of course, I, 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 I'd like to go sort of back to, um, to the beginnings and, you know, that sort of lovely period when he met with Mozart and later with Haydn. So can you tell us about that? Yes. Well, we, there is only one source that says he met Mozart, but I'm sure it happened because it was written uh, by Mozart's biographer, first major biographer, Otto Jahn, not long after Mozart's death. Um, Beethoven was 16 and a quarter, uh, and he managed to get leave of absence from the court orchestra in Bonn to go to Vienna to meet Mozart. Um, and he did meet him. And the story goes that uh, Mozart, who was then 30 and a half years of age, not in very good health, financial problems. He was living, living in a beautiful big apartment in the Domgasse behind St. Stefan's Dome in, in Vienna that he couldn't afford. Um, his family was growing. And the last thing he needed was a, a boy, a teenage boy from somewhere west of here in ill-fitting clothes, ugly pockmarked face. Uh, they say you can play the piano boy, sit and play something. Um, and Beethoven went to the piano and apparently played the opening of the Mozart C minor piano concerto. It's a long orchestral introduction. Then in comes the piano. Bum, 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 bum. I think, I think that's how it goes. Um, and, and Mozart said, no, 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 not that. You've obviously prepared that. Play something of your own. And I like to think that, Mo that Beethoven said to Mozart, Herr Mozart, give me a theme, any theme, and I will improvise on it. Now, Mozart was working on one of his operas. I forget which opera it was he was working on. Maybe it was Marriage of Figaro 
or Don Giovanni at the time. And he might well have gone to the piano and played one of those melodies. And then the boy Beethoven improvised on it. And the story goes that when he finished, uh, Mozart went into the adjoining room where his wife was entertaining guests and famously said, mm -hmm. Stanzi, watch out for that boy. One day he will give the world something to talk about. Now, it may be a romanticized story, but it has a ring of truth to it. Mm -hmm. And Mozart agreed, apparently, to take him on as a pupil, but he got an urgent message from his father in Bonn. Your mother is seriously ill. We fear for her life. You have to leave immediately. And within two weeks of arriving in Vienna, Beethoven had to return to Bonn, where his mother was indeed terminally ill. And by the time he returned to Vienna in November 1791, just short of his 22nd birthday, at uh, 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 92, sorry, 1792, Mozart was dead. So he never met Mozart again. But you know, you, I've often thought, what a tragedy. He never studied with Mozart. But what if he had? Would mm -hmm. Mozart, the perfectionist, have somehow tamed the wild spirit, smoothed the rough edges? Oh. Possibly, because Beethoven admired him greatly and he was only well, 21, nearly 22 when he finally arrived, or in the first occasion, 16 and a quarter. He would have been very impressionable. And in a way, I think we can be grateful that he never received lessons from Mozart, although he didn't see it that way at the time. You think Haydn was less sort of, um, less of into the perfection? I mean, they yes. did grow apart, right? They, they, yeah. they kind of, yeah. Yeah, well, what happened with Haydn was, Haydn was passing through Bonn on his way back to Vienna from London, and Beethoven showed him his manuscript, for, I think it was the cantata on the death of, of the emperor. Um, and Haydn said, blimey, that's good. Uh, if you can get yourself to Vienna, I'll teach you. And Beethoven did go, uh, did make it a couple of years later to Vienna. And Haydn took him on as a pupil. But it was a difficult relationship. Haydn was a man in his 60s. Beethoven was a man in his 20s. Beethoven was seriously good and didn't just didn't really want to be told what to do by somebody who really is sort of a bit going out of fashion now. Um, and they didn't get on all that well. And Haydn left again for London. And while Haydn was away, Beethoven composed his set of three piano trios and gave them the opus number one. Um, and when Haydn came back from his London trip, seriously tired, Beethoven insisted on performing all three for him. And Haydn had the temerity to criticize number three which actually musicologists will tell you is the strongest of the three. Um, and Beethoven was appalled that Haydn would dare criticize it. And they had a flare up, but it was soon passed over because the next opus number, opus number two, three piano sonatas, Beethoven dedicated to Haydn. And when Haydn was given birthday honors, I forget what age it was, maybe when he turned 70 or something, and he was born into the hall on a sedan chair, Beethoven was one of those who queued up to pay homage to him. So the rift was very quickly healed. But regarding um, a teacher and pupil, not very successful. But was it common or, or, or was it actually just a, a really just daring to challenge a teacher? Because I, I, I really kind of, it's interesting because I, you see, I grew up in Russia and for us to challenge a teacher was like... Mm -hmm. It's just impossible, you know, mm. even if you disagree, you, you can't really challenge. Where, of course, in the UK, it's a completely different mentality. You can, I mean, provided you're polite, you can challenge the teacher and it's probably some fun. So can you imagine what was it like to sort of, I mean, it must have been. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty you, see, what, what you, you have to remember two things. First of all, this was Beethoven. He didn't play by the rules. Secondly, he was recognized back in Bonn from his earliest childhood as being exceptional. So by the time he got to Vienna to study with Haydn, he was already the best musician in Bonn, better than all the orchestral players who were 10, 20, 30 years older than him, far and away the most accomplished composer in Bonn, stunning audiences already performing his own compositions. He got to Vienna, which was the capital city of music, and he simply had an unerring belief in himself. One of his earlier teachers before Haydn was, was um, Albrechtsberger, who taught him counterpoint, and some of his exercise books have survived, and they're covered in red crayons that <laughs> Albrechtsberger crossed out. You can't do that, boy, you can't do that. Yes, I can, I'm Beethoven. <laughs> 
Oh, remarkable. And, um, you know, we've just briefly mentioned, you know, the subject of improvisation, you know, when you talked about Mozart. But um, improvisation was one of the arts we really lost. I mean, if you take jazz away, but the classical mu music has lost it. Um, yeah. So um, there was a famous, famous duel uh, and improvisation duel. Uh, fascinating. I'm sure you, 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 you can tell us a lot of interesting facts about it. Well, in Vienna in, in the 1790s, um, improvisation contests were the way the aristocracy entertained themselves. One aristocrat would sponsor one uh, pianist, another would sponsor another, and they would, help, they would hold competitions in the salon of one of them. Um, and the way it would work is one of them, uh, the pianist would go to the piano and play a piece of music that he had himself composed, so the other player could never have heard it before. The other player would then have to go and improvise on it. Then he would set a piece that he had composed, and the other player would... Well, anyway, when they discovered what Beethoven could do, he is made as a pianist was improvisation as Mozart discovered. Give him a tune, any tune, and if you got him in the right mood, he would improvise on it for two hours without ever losing the main theme or without ever repeating himself. And that was his calling card. Because let's face it, although he had a letter of introduction in his back pocket to Prince Lichnowsky, pretty powerful aristocrat, here was this boy, this young man from Bonn, with a guttural accent that was harsh on the sophisticated musical ears of the Viennese, clothes that didn't fit properly, never wore a powdered wig in his life, didn't care about formality and, and, and the way to behave, stormed into these salons and they would have gone, what is this? But the moment he sat at the piano, it all changed. And when they found out that he could improvise like no one else, they put him up against all the local talent and one after the other, he saw them off. Enter Daniel Steibelt, which is the improvisation contest you're referring to. From Prussia, uh, from Berlin, capital of Prussia, brilliant pianist, brilliant improviser. They set up a comp uh, an improvisation contest with Beethoven. Now, one thing Steibelt could do, and he was famous for, he could play a storm on the piano. He could conjure up a storm. Very, not very difficult to do, apparently, but very impressive. Mm -hmm. um, and at the first improvisation contest, Beethoven had had enough by now. I'm fed up with being made to perform like a circus animal for you aristocrats. But he agreed to turn up and Steibelt basically outplayed him. And he just didn't care. But they set up a return match for a week later. And this time, Steibelt made a catastrophic mistake. He took a piece that Beethoven had recently published, took it to the piano and started to fool around with it. Ooh. That was red rag to a bull. Beethoven went to the piano and the legend goes, as he got there, he snatched a piece of music off a stand that Steibelt had written, turned it to the audience, faced it to the audience, turned it upside down, put it on the piano, looked at the opening bars, and played it, and those opening bars turned upside down, so the legend goes, were B flat, E flat, E flat, B e flat, E flat, E flat, Sound familiar? Anyway, he then played it, he unpicked it, he took it apart, he played Steibelt, out of the room, he humiliated him. And Steibelt stormed out of the room and his aristocrat went hurrying after him and Steibelt said, I will never set foot in Vienna again as long as that man remains here. And Beethoven remained in Vienna for the rest of his life and Steibelt was never again seen in Vienna. And Beethoven was never again asked to take on anyone in an improvisation contest. His position as the supreme pianist in the city was established. And what do we get from that? The Eroica. So the legend goes. Unbelievable. Even if, even if the Eroica bit is an exaggeration, the improv improvisation contest certainly happened. And Beethoven certainly humiliated Steibel, and no other pianist again ever dared face him. 
Unbelievable. And what a character. I mean, really, what a character, I must say. Amazing. Um, well, but that, I, I can just about picture him exactly like that with women. So no wonder he wasn't really lucky with those, right? <laughs> He didn't have he didn't have too much success on, on that account. We know he proposed marriage uh, we at least three times, and one of them, Giulietta Guicciardi, it appeared was willing to say yes because she went to her mother and she said yes. She went to her father, who said, "Are you kidding? We all know he's going deaf. You're not marrying a deaf musician. You'll starve." He'll never earn any money. And she was forced to turn him down. She, of course, has the dedication of the Moonlight Sonata. So her name lives on forever. Uh, and she went on, on to marry a mediocre musician. Um, but no, his proposals were always rejected. And, and then Teresa Malfi, subject of Fur Elise, that was probably her, uh, her, uh, her nickname. Um, and the manuscript of Fur Elise was found in her effects after she died as an old lady. Um, and I love the fact that um, when he went, uh, he, he, he intended proposing to her at a soiree, uh, a party that her father was giving. Um, and he was going to present her with this little bagatelle, perform it for her uh, and propose marriage to her. And she got wind of it. And she said to her father, you've got to stop him doing it. It'll be too humiliating for words. And according to a friend, of, a younger friend of Beethoven's who was engaged to Teresa's sister, so we know it's true, Signor Malfatti served an exceedingly strong punch and Beethoven got drunk, blind drunk, made a fool of himself, never performed at the piano, wasn't able to propose. And when a few days later, he asked to go and see Teresa and her dad to apologize, he then wrote a letter to them saying, I'm so sorry for what I did. Thank you for seeing me. However, it would appear that your pet dog, Gigons, was more enamored of me than either of you were. Mm -hmm. And it's only one of two references in all his letters to a pet. They had a little dog whose name was Gigons, who obviously liked Beethoven, which neither Teresa nor her father appeared to do. So he didn't, he didn't succeed in that, in that uh, proposal either. Uh, and the only woman we know who ever returned his love is the subject of the letter to the immortal beloved, but we still don't know for sure who she was. I, I must ask you whether you have any takes. Any? Any takes on who that was? Well, it seems to have been narrowed down to two people, Anthony Brentano and, uh, and, uh, 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 the, 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 from Brunswick, Josephine Brunswick. Um, now, Maynard Solomon in the 70s analyzed everything there was to analyze, even the time of the mail coach, by w which he just missed giving the, the letter to, and established that it has to be Antoni Brentano because she was in Prague in the first week of July 1812, where their brief relationship occurred. She was in the spa town of Carlsbad in the weeks following, and the evidence of the letter confirms those two facts, and she was well known to Beethoven in Vienna. Now, Maynard Solomon says in his, in his uh, biography of the 70s, I, I can now claim it, 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 it is not too much to claim that the mystery is now solved. Well, he was wrong there because there have been so many more theories since then. And that the, the, although she fits the bill in every respect, and there are many factors pointing towards her, when she was in Prague in the first week of July 1812, where Beethoven met the woman to whom he wrote the letter and spent several hours with her, probably overnight, she was in Prague with her husband and one of their children, who they were taking to a, the spa town of Carlsbad because the child had congested lungs. Would she have left the husband and child to have a secret tryst with Beethoven? Would Beethoven, that most moralistic of men, had a secret tryst with a married woman and mother? It's unlikely. Josephine Brunswick is a much more likely candidate in that we know Beethoven was deeply in love with her. He wrote her a series of love letters pleading for a physical relationship. She was a widow at the time, so she was available. She was free, as it were. 
However, there is no record at all that she left Vienna at this stage because whoever the woman was had to be in Prague in the first week of July 1812 and the spa town of Carlsbad following. Now, at this time, Austria was more or less constantly at war with the French. You couldn't just cross borders willy-nilly. You had to show your passport. Records were taken. So she would have had to cover up every single record. Also, Beethoven ultimately, he, he kind of went off her. She, she, did, she, she had a desperately tragic life because in, after that, she married again with disastrous marriage. Um, and Beethoven, she started to put rumors around about her relationship with Beethoven and Beethoven kept his distance. So in a way, although she is a highly possible candidate, there are factors against her too. At the moment, Julia, the truthful answer is we don't for sure. It might be a woman whose name as yet is unknown to history. In a hundred years time, they might find a letter in a shoebox in an attic somewhere in Europe that gives us the answer. And I won't be here to know <laughs> Well, it's absolutely fascinating. And I must mention that we are talking in this series to Jessica Duchin, who is currently writing a book oh, yeah. on yes. Immortal Beloved. So please follow the series to find more about yes. this fascinating subject. Well, John, uh, this has been a sheer delight. You know, Beethoven really came to life. You know, I could really feel him here somehow virtually on Zoom, his spirit coming. Lovely. So thank you. Thank you very much for being my guest and for your wonderful stories. Thank you. Pleasure Thank you. talking to you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.